Let us pray. As soon as I get this all, let's pray. Lord God, we come this day as your people, hopeful, hopeful for healing in our lives, hopeful for healing in our nation and in the world. We come this day concerned about the COVID virus. Father, be with those who are sick. Be with those who care for them. And be for the scientists who are working hard to, 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 to help us get rid of this virus. And for those who are given the shots, give them energy and life. Oh, Father, we put our trust in you. We put our hope in you. We put our love in you. In Jesus, amen. We're glad you're here this day, and a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, we will begin to serve meals out the back door this next week, and y'all are more familiar with that than I am, but on Wednesday of this week, so if you need to go ahead and sign up. I, I'd encourage you to, I mean, meals are borrowing five dollars a piece. You, you can uh, call one of your neighbors who uh, is not able to get out too much and carry them a meal, and it'll make a lot of difference. So I encourage you to do that as, as, as we're here. Uh, also, uh, the, the COVID, we've gone from a low risk to, to moderate risk here, so be careful where you're going and what you do. But we're here as God's people. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. I think we can all agree that there's a lot of healing that's needed in our world today. Much of it of a, uh, much of it of a medical nature, but also a whole lot more. Today's call to worship is a prayer for healing, coming straight from our Methodist hymnal, page 262, titled Heal Me, Hands of Jesus. When we resume congregational singing, I'd like for us to become more familiar with this hymn. Its text is simple but prolific. Please hear it now as today's call to worship. Heal me, hands of Jesus, and search out all my pain. Restore my hope, remove my fear, and bring me peace again. Cleanse me, blood of Jesus, take bitterness away. Let me forgive as one forgiven and bring me peace today. Know me, mind of Jesus, and show me all my sin. Dispel the memories of guilt and bring me peace within. Fill me, joy of Jesus. Anxiety shall cease and heaven's serenity be mine. For Jesus brings me Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we seek your presence this day as we worship. Help us to, to find your healing hand for us. May we this day as we're here in worship and as we will be over the internet soon, may we be a people who trust you and follow you in all we do. May this service of worship be a tr tribute to your love and your care. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's share the Lord's Prayer. We don't do that very often, but I think we can do that here. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Focus this week is the hymn, There's Something About That Name. And helping us with that presentation are Pamela and Clendon Rains, and of course Brenda and Miss Pam down here who will be projecting our words later on the screen. Jesus, the mere mention of his name can calm the storm, heal the broken, raise the dead. At the name of Jesus, sin-hardened men have melted, derelicts have been transformed, the lights of hope put back in the eyes of a hopeless child. At the name of Jesus, hatred and bitterness have turned to love and forgiveness, arguments have ceased, parents have softly breathed the name Jesus at the bedside of a child delirious with fever and watched that little body be quieted, its fevered brow cooled. Families sitting at the bedside of dying saints whose bodies were racked with pain have observed their loved ones in those final seconds summon their last ounce of ebbing strength to whisper Earth's sweetest name, Jesus, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the Earth with the very blood those who claimed it, yet it still stands. And there shall be that final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race shall rise in one mighty chorus and proclaim the name Jesus. For in that day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ truly is Lord. So you see, it was not mere chance that caused an angel one night long ago to say to a virgin maiden, his name shall be called Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, there is something about that name. Thank you so much. Kingdoms and ki- will pass away, but there's something about that name. Thank you so much. I, I want you to stand again today for the scripture as we re- stand in respect, as we stand in attention to hear God's word. We're still in the, the first chapter of Mark. Last week, uh, 
I, I told you about how G, Mark slowed down there and talked about the disciples, how they, they dropped their nets and followed Jesus, how they left their parents, their father, Zebedee, and followed Jesus. And, and so this is another one that has some real detail in it. In Mark, the first chapter, starting with the 21st verse, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he, he talked to them as one with authority and not like the scribes. The scribes would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so said this, and Rabbi so-and-so said that about it, but, but Jesus spoke with, with, with real authority. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirits convulsed him, convulsing him and, and crying in a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on saying to one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the whole region of Galilee. This is God's word for our lives. Thanks be to God. Martin Marty, a professor of sociology of religion from the University of Chicago Divinity School, tells about one time he was walking down one of the very exclusive streets in downtown Chicago. And as he walked along, he, he saw in front of him uh, a guy who was homeless. At least he looked homeless. He had on an old coat. As you got closer, there was a smell about him, and uh, he had a, a, a scraggly beard. And so uh, the, the, Martin saw him and noticed that folks kind of avoided him in some ways. And as he got as he got there closer, he he realized that the the guy was was pointing to people. He would hold up one finger like this, and he'd point to somebody and say "guilty," and then he'd hold that finger up and would point over this way, and somebody else says "guilty." And Martin was kind of amused by this as he, he watched it, but, but what happened was that as people walked along the way, uh, the, it, it, as they got there, they'd kind of avoid him, and, and if he, he kind of caught them and said, guilty, they'd kind of look up, oh, how'd you know, and then they'd, they'd kind of hurry away. Martin did this for a while, and it seemed to be inevitable. Anybody who had the finger pointed at them would say, it would be called guilty, would kind of be embarrassed and walked away as if they were surprised that, that somebody knew. That story uh, always amused me because I think that most of us know what guilt is about. There are some folks who are kind of arrogant and, and who are never feel guilty, but most of us know what it means to feel guilty. We feel guilty a lot more than we ought to, but, but we feel that way. And, and so what happens is we, we begin to live our lives uh, kind of ashamed of ourselves or frustrated with ourselves because we do feel guilty. But, but I want you to look at this story a little bit. You notice that in this story about this man who had this evil spirit, that, that Jesus did not condemn the man. He condemned the, the evil spirit. He did not say to the man, you ought to be better. He he called out to the spirit and says, get out of him. And the spirit left him. Jesus had that about himself. He, he always tended to, to, to care for people in such a way that they, uh, they knew that he loved them. If you look at the scriptures, the main folks that Jesus got mad at were religious folks like me. That's always bothered me. I wish Jesus had, had condemned uh, other folks, but but he did. The rabbis and and chief priests and folks like that. They were the ones that got condemned by him. Uh, I think because of their piety and their their uh, their arrogance sometimes. 
Because most of us, though, we get arrogant sometimes. We, we know who we are, and we know that we feel guilty. I had a friend one time that, that said, you know, if people knew what I really thought, thought sometimes, they would not like me. And I thought, yeah, you're probably right about that, and, and don't ask me what I'm thinking sometimes either. We, we have these thoughts, we have these feelings, these things that uh, are just not what we ought to be. We know who we are. We know that we're sinners. We're sinners who, who, who miss the mark. We don't chin the bar, as we sometimes say in, in, in sports, sports things. But, but we are those kind of people. But like I said, notice this story. Jesus does not condemn the man. He calls for the spirit to leave him, the evil spirit to leave him. And that to me is very much the story of our lives, is it? That Jesus comes into our lives and he calls us to be a different kind of people. He calls us not to be condemn ourselves but set ourselves free. You look at the times in the life of Jesus that he did this. There's a story about a woman who, who touched the fringe of his garments. And when Jesus found out who did it, he, he turned around and who did it. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. She thought she was going to be condemned, but Jesus says, no, your, your faith has made you well. And I think that's what Jesus does to us again and again. Because we know what it means to be broken. But Jesus knows what it means to heal. We, we sometimes allow our brokenness to define us. To tell us who we are. But really the love of Jesus. The grace he has for us. That is what needs to define us who we are. I'm a child of God. There was a young boy one time who uh, had one of those days. Everything he did was the wrong thing. He, uh, he knocked over, his, he, he, he knocked over the, 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 the place where his, his sister was, was drawing something and he, he, the paper ripped. And so he, she called, Mama. His mother said, when your father comes home, and that's all he actually had to say. And, and, and later on in the day, he, he, he did some other things. He, he was outside when one was supposed to be and other things like that. And every time the words came, when your father comes home. And so a little boy was in his room and he heard the car pull in. He heard the door slam and the open door into the, the house. And then he heard his mother and father talking. And he couldn't hear the words, but he knew what was going on. And so his father began to come up the stairs and it seemed like an eternity. It was kind of an uh, execution walk. And he came up and he opened the door and looked at the little boy who was kind of scoured over in the corner. And, he, and the little boy says, you can't hurt me, I'm baptized. <laughs> you, you know, that's a, a funny story, but that's, that's really the reality of the way Jesus is. Jesus comes into our lives where we're broken and where we need healing. And just like he, he took that man who had the evil spirit and drove the evil spirit out, what Jesus does is he works through us to find healing and move beyond that. Well, how does Jesus do that? He does that through the church. He does that through grace that we don't understand, that we are amazed at. But, but I want to pick up on the church, how important that is for us. When I was about 14 or 15, and, and one of those teenagers that had the raging hormones, and uh, I didn't know quite, I always felt guilty, and I didn't know quite how to handle myself. Uh, I, I was part of the church, and they treated me very, very nice, and I, and I appreciated that. But, but I, I heard a man say to my father one day, he says, Reagan is going to amount to something. Reagan is going to amount to something. 
here was a 16-year-old boy, 15-year-old boy, and I felt like I was condemned because of my thoughts. I was condemned because I was not, my grades were okay, but not as good as some of my friends. Reagan's going to be okay. Reagan's going to do something important one day. That's the church. Uh, you know, I, I've struggled with the church through the years. Sometimes I think that we are, we go one way when we ought to go the other way. But I always know in the church there is love and there's grace. He comes to us. He gives us grace. And he gives us hope. And he gives us life. Now, let me tell you about one church that, that I know about that, that does this very well. It's Gingenberg Church. I can't pronounce it. My mouth's kind of dry. But Gingenberg Church is, is halfway between Cincinnati uh, and, and, uh, and Dayton, Ohio, a place called Trap City. It's kind of out of the country somewhere. But, but it's right next to the interstate. When we go that way to go to Detroit to see our, our daughter, I, I see that church, and every time I'm kind of surprised. It's not a humongous, big, beautiful cathedral. Most of them are just kind of uh, what we used to call butler buildings, you know, just kind of metal buildings. And I thought, how in the world can that church attract people with that kind of stuff like that? Well, they are one of the largest Methodist churches, and, and they sent their praise team, which was a, about 20 folks, down to conference one time a year to, to lead our music for us at, at, in, in Birmingham. Well, one day after, uh, after when I went out to lunch, I, I went someplace, and it, I guess I had a dessert or something. Don't, don't tell Sally this, but, but I went and had dessert somewhere when I was through. And then I came back, so I was a little late. And then I couldn't find a parking place, so I finally got up there. And when I got there, I found out that the, the children's group that meet, met at conference were, uh, were finishing their singing. So I stood at the back, uh, uh, and as I stood there, I saw all the folks who were part of the Gingensburg group right there on both sides. And the kids began to come out. And as they came, those folks clapped for them. And those kids, you know, they were, they were three and four feet high, but they were about six feet by the time they walked out that door. <laughs> because they, this folk, they had been appreciated, they had been cared for by these folks. You know, we think that we can't throw out demons out of people. But I can tell you from my own experience, personal experience, and by looking at those kids, we can. We can by the way we love and care for each other. That's what the whole thing is about, is about caring. And, and we may not be able to do the marvelous miracle things that Jesus did, but, but, but in the very way we do things, we can drive out demons. Sometimes it's very, very difficult and we don't get very far with it. I, I know one person who, uh, who complained that uh, his parents never bought him a horse and he wanted one. And he was in his 60s at that point. And, uh, I, I, and then I thought, well, he said, but they bought one for my sister. He could not get his mind around the fact that his sister was 10 years younger than them. My parents had begun to make more money during that period, and they moved to a house that had a barn behind it. So, so you, you know, but he couldn't understand why they never got him a horse when he wanted one. You know, all the logic I brought to him did not do any good. In fact, I may have driven it de deeper. I'm not sure. But, but, but the thing about it was he, he felt like he was condemned. And that's the way sometimes we feel. But you see, Jesus is in the, the business of freeing us from our demons. And the job of the church is to cooperate in that work. Uh, sometimes demons stay with us for a long time. But Jesus does too. When we were serving Muscle Shows, so there was a we were having a building campaign, and what you do in a building campaign, which some of you know because you've been a part of them, is that you, you take the, the top ten givers of your church and you, and you put them on a committee. 
because they know what giving is about. Uh, and they also will give, if they give well to the church, they'll give well to the building fund. And, and so w w they gave me the list of the names of those 10 people. And yep, 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 yep. Then I saw the name Joe Cruz. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. Joe would come into where we had coffee every East, every Sunday, and he would kind of be over in the corner drinking his coffee by himself. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he just didn't have the look. He, he was a part of the choir, but about half the time he was asleep. So, so I always wondered, well, what did he do the night before? Well, well I was shocked at the, at the giving level he had, so I, I, I didn't know what the giving level was. He was just one of the top ten givers. So I, I called him up and said, uh, Joe, uh, can we have lunch together? He said, sure. So we went out to lunch together, and so I, I began to hear his story. The reason he was always so asleep as he came to church was because he worked at Cortland at the paper mill and he worked the midnight shift. So he usually came in pretty well sleepy. He has not had any sleep for a while. I learned right then, never judge anybody by how they look because you don't know what they're going through. Well, well, well Joe had this job, but it was, he was faithful to the church and he was there whether he was asleep or not. Maybe my sermon was kind of osmosis into him. I'm not sure. But, but he was there. Uh, and then, uh, not only that, he had a, a, a daughter who was anorexic. And he and his wife, who he was divorced from, they spent a lot of time trying to take care of her and get her better. And I don't know how much you know about being anorexic, but it's very difficult to have a person turn around from that because their habits are, are, are so ingrained sometimes. Well, well, they were dealing with that as a husband and wife who were divorced. And, and then on top of that, Joe was divorced. Joe also, as a sideline, would work on, uh, on used cars. And he'd fix them up a little bit, then he'd sell them. Well, I don't think Joe ever made any money from that. Because he, he cared for people so much, I think he, did, he probably lost money on most cars. But, but that was Joe. And I said, Joe... Why do you give like you do to the church? He says, because God is so good to me. And I thought, wait a minute, Joe. Uh, are we talking about the same person? You, 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 you have this dead-end job at, the, at, at Cortland at the uh, paper plant. You, you, you have an anorexic daughter. You have a, you've been divorced. He says, you know, is God good to you and all that? It was amazing that God was good to him. Uh, later on, one time, uh, this doesn't deal with time, but I, I, he wanted to go out to, to give somebody a Christmas. So we arranged it, and we went. And he said, "Will you go with me?" I don't know what to say, so I went with him, and and we astonished his family, who was way out in the wood, way out in the, in the boondocks, who had very little contact with social agencies. So we gave this Christmas, and they were astonished. And as I drove back away, I looked over at Joe, and there were tears coming down his eyes. He knew what it meant that God was good, and he shared that. Despite all of his struggles, he knew God was good. And that's what we have to realize when we are folks who get caught up in our guilt. And, and guilt is a gift that keeps on giving, and, and we are good at Given it, and we're good at receiving it sometimes. But Jesus comes in and says, you are forgiven. What, me, forgiven? You're forgiven. To the man in the, in the, in the synagogue there in Capernaum, he drives out the evil spirit. And suddenly there was a man again, forgiven, given life. See, that's what Jesus is about. Jesus is about setting us free. And we in the church sometimes are the, are, are the worst about feeling guilty. But Jesus comes in and says, you're forgiven. Yes, we, we have to take care of the struggles we have with us. But we have a step ahead because we have been forgiven. 
we have found one who wants to drive the demons out of our lives. And that makes all the difference. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we know what it feels like to have a man come down and say guilty to us. Because whether we are or not, we feel that way. You are the God who sets us free. You are the God who gives us life. And in all of our brokenness, you are there to put us back together. Thanks be to you, O Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Keep your distance from each other. We're still at, we've moved from a green, which was a low risk. We've moved to the yellow category, which is medium risk. So, so be careful where you go and wear your mask. Amen. Go in peace.